Hey everyone, on today's podcast, we have David Helgeson, the founder of Unity. Now, this is a very fun podcast for me because I've, I've been big fans of the Helgeson family for a long time now. Good friends with, with his brothers, Ari and Ingvar, investor in Ingvar's company, actually, Vetro Labs. And, you know, one of the fascinating stories about, um, uh, you know, the, the team, the team Helgeson, is how successful they've been, each in their own unique way. And David's story is fascinating to me because he's transformed a whole industry around runtime environments and having a, a place where people can author really compelling, not only tools, but also games. And so with that, welcome, David. Thanks. Thanks. And I, you know, I just always feel I need to insert, we were actually three founders and, and now it's a big team effort, but yes, we, you know, we, we've done, we've done really interesting work at Unity, that's for sure. Well, we always like to go to, to the background of people first, before we go mm -hmm. into sort of like where, where they were kind of their name okay. got chiseled. And so in, in your case, it's a little bit about your university and a little bit about your first few jobs. And well, I think we have I was to talk about my university? Was, well, we, we do, we do glorious, and we don't. You know? <laughs> yeah, we do, we do and we don't. I, actually, what's really funny, and I was sharing this with you earlier, it's like, if, if you guys are on this and you go to David's uh, LinkedIn profile, it is one of the best uh, LinkedIn profiles I have ever read. Because he, he narrates his, his, his sort of experience with that specific role. And, and maybe I'll just leave it open-ended for you, David, to, to sort of share with us that sort of early journey, like everything from the challenges that you might have felt during university, and then also those first few roles in, in programming. What, what was that like? Oh, man, yeah. So, you know, I'm, I stand a kid uh, that moved to Denmark. Uh, our mother moved to Denmark when I, when, when I was 10 and my brother's younger. Um, you know, she was a journalist. She's a journalist. Well, she was actually writing her doctoral thesis back then. And she got a computer, and and so basically, in every moment she was not using the computer, I was using her computer. And it was this weird early PC. Like we, I didn't have a have a Commodore like everyone else or Atari. So so I you know had this weird PC, and there was no games on it. So I just somebody gave me a basic interpreter and told me like, you know, that I could make my own games. Um, you know, born in 77, I think that whole generation of programmers, basically, you know, we all learned to program to make games, right? Uh, so I also did that. I, I, I didn't actually become a game developer, arguably, ever, um, but, but definitely not that back then. So now it's just this kind of kid who are spending all the time programming and fooling around with the computer. Um, what was yeah. your favorite game during that time? I didn't have any. <laughs> no. I mean... Um, Games did. I mean, I you know I played games on friends' computers. Um, Defender was the first video game I played. Um, mm. Still remember the <laughs> jarring audio of that. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Um, I don't know. I, I I didn't play that many. I mean, I played a bunch of games. Um, there was the submarine games, winter games. Like, I don't know this all this weird stuff. So, yeah, um, so you had all this, all this sort of <laughs> drive to like improve that gaming experience, and then you decided no, to start. No, I was, I was just, I was just learning. I, I wasn't actually trying to fix anything. I was just like, I was, I was just super infatuated with computers. There's just mm -hmm. something in there that I, I just had to spend all my waking hours, every waking hour there. Um, I did have well that and and, and studying and reading about the, like physics and, and other science stuff. And so, you know, it sounds like there was a, a very, a very quick transition from like doing some programming work for other companies to starting your own company with, with Pan Media. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that transition from like doing work for other people to, yeah, to yeah. Then deciding you want to start your own thing? Sure. So, you know, I, I, when I finished high school, uh, I, uh, I was going to take a guy, I was always, always going to be a, like a, a scientist. So I was going to study physics or, or psychology. And I ended up studying a bit of both, but but I, I you know but I was going to take a gap year like all my friends. Um, so I just uh, instead of um, cleaning you know cleaning 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 apartments or or, or doing stuff like that, working in cafes or or traveling uh, through Latin America, which I sort of regret I didn't do, still haven't. Uh, my um, I, I I I got a kind of a summer no like I don't know like a little gig at a web agency in '96, which you know. It, well, it was just a hot, hot, hot era for, for web, you know, everyone who could write a little bit of HTML basically had a job. Um, so I, I got that gig and, and that sort of became like a multi-year kind of, you know, making websites for people and working for ad agencies. And there was nothing super glorious about it. I didn't respect mm -hmm. it at all. I was just always kind of heading back to university. 
mm. and I, I did go back from time to time. Um, but then I, I, got, I got really fed up with it. Um, but I was so lucky that I got like a little, like uh, just a contract job with a sort of a software agency. And they were also just doing contract work, but they had like real craftsmanship and kind of gave me a respect and I learned a whole, whole lot from them. Um, and I, at the end of that project, which was just a few months, I was like, I want to be, I want to be like, I want to be that. <laughs> like, you know, I'll, I can have my own company. And I never thought of that before. Um, and I, you know, it's my own company. I can have my own music on the stereo. It's just, it's got to be my thing, you know? And then I started a few companies that really didn't go anywhere, <laughs> but at least, you know, tried. So maybe, maybe walk us through those two companies. Like how, how big did they get in terms of team? Oh, at, at... oh super small. I mean, this is nullities basically. So, um, so Pan Media was just a contract consulting company. We did some work for Nokia and stuff, but, um, it wasn't very exciting. I learned a bunch working at Nokia as a coder, but you know, like the company didn't give me much. Yeah. Um, this is a, a good, a good, a good era for Nokia. They, they had a real kind of respect for, you know, engineers and for, 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 for the craft of, of building stuff. Um, the, 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 the other, the other thing I think uh, you you noticed was uh, was this eye cover, which was yeah. uh, not my idea, but but I, I, I in in effect I, be, I guess I was like a kind of a CTO of the project, um, and the idea by some musicians was to kind of create interactive content to go along with 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 um, with CDs. So you buy a music CD, which was still a thing for a moment back then, uh, and then if you, if you bought the CD, you would have kind of a login to a website of some sort, and you would have some access to backstage contact with the uh, artists stuff like that uh we made like one one of those for like a sort of Danish, famous danish artist um and uh and and therefore probably had like 10 15000 dollars euro or whatever of of revenue <laughs> and it did come out but that was the one thing uh, it was a complete that nobody cared nobody logged in um it wasn't very good. It wasn't very well done either, but like the problem was like more fundamental in nature than whether it was well done or not. Um, and uh, as, I, as, I, as I pointed out somewhere that, you know, Apple tried, Apple tried this later with iTunes LP and they also sort of kind of failed. So I don't feel so bad. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. definitely. So if, if we look at the timeline, just so that I get it right, mm -hmm. um, was there a period between when you you kind of gave up on iCover before you started Unity. Was there like a hiatus there? Or was it, did you transition yeah, so quickly? I, I was just going back and forth between university and projects. I was always doing some projects. I, you know, okay. a whole bunch of little programming projects and try to kind of thinking about commercializing some of them. Nothing really happened much. All right. Um, uh, then at some point I was really fed up with, with this project work at Penn Media uh, and an old friend from high school, um, uh, wanted to make video games and we talked about that. We, we talked about doing it together, but I was kind of still stuck doing project work. Um, so instead he found, or sort of in the meantime, he found a German guy online that, and they started collaborating on this video game project. Um, and then when I finally freed up from my project work, I joined them um, as uh, what sort of became the third founder in a project game company that then sort of evolved into Unity. <laughs> which, uh, you know, basically we took, we took the internal engine we were working on and we decided to commercialize that and fell so in love gonna, with the idea of, of that. We're going we're gonna to jump into the story of Unity in a, in a second, mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to first just put it round out some of the experience that you picked up from Pan Media and iCover. And, and just to help <laughs> you organize that, you know, usually people look back and they, and they think, okay, the mistakes that I made were uh, product mistakes or they were customer identification mistakes or market sizing mistakes mm. or sales mistakes or human resources mistakes. If you look mm. back on them with a little bit of sort of like, you know, empathy towards a younger David, but if you say, okay, well, <laughs> you know, actually I could have probably avoided some mistakes with these following lessons. What, what would you say those are? That's a good question. Um, so the Pan Media experience, like, you know, we, we were three guys. We, we had sort of fairly different ideas about what we wanted to do. I really wanted to make a product company and, and the others, I don't know if they really did or we didn't really have a clear, we just didn't talk about it clearly. Like we're good friends. It wasn't like we couldn't talk. We just said, I don't know that we didn't ask the right questions. We didn't challenge each other, I guess, or ourselves uh, with, with, with sort of, you know, what, what I later came to recognize as, as, you know, the wonderful brutal honesty <laughs> that, that we, you know, developed at unity. Um, so yeah, just, you know, it was just, 
And then we ended up doing this project work and it was fine and I got really fed up with it. Um, uh, because yes, you can learn a bunch from project work. Obviously, like you're working on complicated projects in some bigger companies that presumably have some knowledge that you can get. But but yeah, it wasn't very interesting. And that, but by the time we sort of had a hiatus, hiatus in project work, and we talked about doing actual you know products, um, you know we, there was no alignment. So you know the thing was very much destined to fall apart. With 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 iCover, the um, it was just, you know, some Danish musicians who had the idea and, you know, I joined them as this kid and I was trying to help them. And the thing is, it's sort of a different era. Like, you know, now the idea of making a minimum viable product and there's a whole sort of methodology in building companies and startups now that, that is not perfect, but it's, you know, very well defined and, and you can really kind of lean on it to some level or at least use it as a, as a sort of a, what do you call it, like a, like a, a filter or like a, like a lens to understand what you're doing. And, and this just didn't exist, at least not in Europe. I mean, mm. I'm sure there were people that understood this in, in the Valley. And of course, you know, some people just learned it on their own everywhere because there's companies from everywhere, everywhere in the world, but, but man, did this not exist. Um, so no, it was just confusion, just like youthful confusion, <laughs> trying to do some stuff that I, I could, I could, like, I could see the ideas were interesting. Uh, like, but yeah, no, there was no, there was no clarity. All right. Well, if, if, if confusion was like something that I think you moved away from into a new organization like Unity, what was that early confusion like? Because I mean, it's always messy at the very beginning. How did, yeah, how yeah. did you define the problem? How did you guys define the problem? Like who were you solving the problem for with Unity in that very first few uh, years of, of, of the beginnings of the company? Sure. I mean, first we just wanted to make video games. You know, we you know we we had sort of passions for that in different ways. You know, we had all played games since we were kids. Um, again, we came at it with fairly different ideas or ideologies, but but you know there was a lot of fascination with the medium. Um, some of the early conversations were like, so you know why don't we love video games so much? <laughs> well, you know because video games seem to you know, not really relate to the real world and we'd like to kind of relate to the real world and, you know, tell stories of the real world or change the world through stories. And then, um, you know, we, we had all kinds of ideas about how to do that. Um, and then, you know, we realized we had absolutely no knowledge of how to make games and no resources. So we ended up making a very small game that was just like a toy game uh, called Goo Ball that also sold only a few thousand copies. But, 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 um, but at least we were always developing, like we're always thinking very, you know, we're challenging each other. It was just a really, I mean, those guys are amazing, right? Nicholas and Joachim. Joachim is still CTO. Nicholas left some years earlier. Um, and they're just, they're just fierce and smart and, and like brutally honest. And I just love these moments. So there's a lot of kind of just stumbling around in the ideas and, um, and so on. And in, in a way, the game part of the story is not so interesting. We, we, we built an engine for ourselves because, you know, Unity didn't exist. And there was nothing kind of readily, readily available that was also good. There were some open source projects, but they were atrocious. And then there were some really expensive commercial stuff um, that also was kind of complicated to use. Um, so we were developing our own engine, just as everyone did back then. Like there was literally thousands of game engines, probably tens of thousands, honestly, if you count sort of everything with. Um, internal engines. So we did that. Um, and for various reasons, like my co-founders had unbelievable design sensibilities, maybe especially Nicholas, who came from a very sort of broad range of making film and a bit of music, I guess, and, and 3D and so on. Um, and uh, we were a Mac shop, which is like the only, the only, 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 only company in the game industry that used Macs, I guess, pretty much. So Maybe there was a design kind of intuition that came from that as well. Um, so after working on it for a while, we sort of looked at it and we saw that it was actually kind of polished and interesting and well done. Um, and there was a focus on workflows, which the rest of the game industry barely had. Um, or at least if, if they were thinking about workflows, it was workflows for big teams and not small teams as we were. Um, so at some point we looked at it and we were like, we're like this is something. <laughs> This is different. Um, and, you know, the rest of the industry had, for various good reasons, been focused on bigger and bigger project, uh, projects. Um, you know, even, 
you know, ma mobile gaming didn't really exist yet or was super bad. Uh, PC gaming was in trouble. Where, where all the money was being made at the time was the Xbox and the PlayStation and, and the GameCube, I guess. Um, you know, so console games. Um, so the, the, the most of the games industry was running there. Um, and we just had these kind of intuitions that small teams would matter. You know, indie games wasn't really a concept yet, I think, or I'm not sure when that, that, that is, when that term is invented. It may have existed, but it wasn't like well established. But this feeling of like smaller teams making games that would matter to the world, there was a lot of like kind of authorism going on or a bit of authorism. And, and, and so our intuitions were like towards that group. Um, small teams, you know, not going through traditional channels. Um, and, and yeah, there was a feeling that Unity might, might fit this group. And we decided to commercialize Unity sort of initially for that group. Um, but, so if we talk a little bit about that group, because like, that's your mm -hmm. early customer set, right? And so you, you talked a little just, bit about- just, just, just people like us, basically, <laughs> except you know, they were better at making games than we. So if, if, you look at, if you look at that small group and you say mm -hmm. that that was your early customer group that, that evangelized the product for other new people and therefore became mm -hmm. the biggest voices for you, was there, you know, you, you gave me several things. You said that you, the product was built around workflows. It was more useful for small teams and it was a nice looking, well-designed product. Was there, other than those elements, which are, you know, they're like, they add up, right? But was there some magic element that defined the product and that made it like, okay, this is substantially different as a runtime environment. It will make, it'll make it so much more powerful in ways that nobody else could do. Yeah. Or was it just that there was a lack of alternatives for small teams with nice workflows? Like wh which one of what was it? Was it like this magic element or was it more just like there just wasn't anything addressing that customer? So customers were like, oh, this is the only thing we got. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> that was probably a lot of it. And, and, and you know, just, uh, you know, the, it's like the whole experience of the product was designed from that idea. How, how, how would that describe itself? Um, so we decided we would, there was a category, which still exists, I guess, but it was clear back then called professional software. Um, you know, Final Cut Pro, uh, Macromedia Director, Photoshop, I guess, um, you know, where, you know, the, the, it's just like, it's, 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 you know, it's, there's an obsession, obsession with the user in front of the computer and, yeah. and, you know, and maybe, you know, at most a few people that he or she is working with. Um, and the business model is built on the individual user. So you are a Unity user or you are a Photoshop user. Um, you know, and, and you don't necessarily have to kind of, mm, kind of, yeah, you don't have to call somebody and negotiate a price on a per, per game basis, something, something. But, you, you know, you just start using, using the software. So there's a free trial. Later, there was a premium, of course, but we didn't actually come up with that initially. Um, and, and, and then like the whole just design sensibility sort of develop, developed from there. Like, we, you know, the website even tried to copy sort of the professional software section of the Apple website. Uh, Final Cut Pro was probably the biggest sort of visual um, inspiration for, for and, and workflow inspiration for, for the Unity editor. Um, and I think people just recognized that, that this was different. Like game engines at the time were like source code you would download and then like something would happen. and there might be sort of, yeah, there might be sort of various editing tools, but it wasn't unified. Um, another way to put it is that, you know, all the game, game engines up until Unity were basically written from the, ed, from the engine out. So you start with something that renders pixels and, and, and calculates audio and, and physics and so on. And then you add sort of tools around that. And Unity was different. Like we, we actually, it was like almost editor in. You start with the workflow and the tool and then, you know, the engine is sort of written inside of that later. Uh, that meant, of course, that, you know, our editor was really good and the engine was kind of atrocious yeah. um, because the editor defined the, the engine uh, or like dictated the engine. Um, but it was kind of what was needed for that group of people and for that era. And then, you know, we were unbelievably lucky that the, sort of the indie revolution was about to happen. And then, you know, the smartphone <laughs> revolution came also, you know, so, by, by, by the way, we, we started working on Unity sort of 2002, 3, 4, 
we we launch uh, a sort of a early access in 2005 um and then uh, you know the, as, as, as you may remember you know the app store opens in 2008 so by the time we've been in the market for a couple of years and just been struggling to put it together and make a few customers happy and so on it actually started happening yeah like like, actually, like suddenly like the, the group of people that might use this work was growing very fast yeah it's, it's actually interesting the way you described it a little earlier like the, it was really an editor with like an engine that you maybe not were as happy about but that the mm -hmm. editor element made it such that people preferred yeah. this versus the other way of designing things it's almost like you're willing to tolerate the engine the yeah. faults of the engine because the editor were so great and and i know that unity today isn't serving just um, no, no. I mean, like, like late, later, of course, the, the engine got rewritten. It's being rewritten again. Like it's it's actually really good now. Um, yeah. But yeah, no. The, the, but there was a like there is a sort of a yeah. You have to pick your battles, and and the battle there, you know, it wasn't super strategic, but maybe maybe intuitively correct that you know we would just want to cuddle the user and make sure the user was feeling really good. Yeah, and and so I think the. The interesting, the fascinating thing is that you've now managed to capture automotive, transportation, manufacturing, film, <laughs> cinematics, architecture, engineering, construction. We're, as we're working on it. <laughs> like these are customer segments that are not your original one. And, nope. and but they're similar. I, like they're, like it's, yeah. it's professional sitting in front of computers, right? I know that's, that's almost too generic to say, but, but, but actually Unity is almost a better fit I mean, now we're really good for the game industry. We've done it wonderfully well, and I'm really proud of the customer wins we're getting now, uh, and it's great. Um, and, and by the way, we didn't win from mo another competitor, which is one from like people writing their own engines. Mm -hmm. um, so now very few people are writing their own engines, except at the very high end, where a few of the really big studios have their own engines, and everyone else is, is using, well, mostly Unity, or <laughs> a couple of competitors. Um, um, when you come to the other industries, actually, you know, they don't have necessarily the capacity to write their own engines. They don't have the history of that, the, you know, the, the, the sort of experience of that. So actually Unity is an even better fit there um, where, you know, we have a whole bunch of people how, with workstations with professional software. But was that a proactive thing that you did or is it, or is it just happened? Did, did you guys say, I'm going to go, you know, we, we, we have enough game developers, mm -hmm. but, you know, game developers aren't always rich and they can't always pay their bills. And, and you know what, <laughs> sure. construction, that's always reliable. Let's yeah, go yeah. after that yeah actually it was even earlier like we had this intuition that uh, and like a bizarrely good intuition by the way that that you know we would see a future where um where game engines would get used for a lot of different things um you know in the the first business plan we wrote is actually lost to history but the second one from 2005 which was more like a sort of a plan of action um you know actually describes touching a lot of other other industries um uh, and and the first few years we actually had almost more success outside of the game industry than inside um then we sort of crossed some kind of a uh, threshold and, and we got good enough for the game industry and the iphone or smartphone revolution happened so we had this huge kind of a uh, burst of success or like decade of success inside games um uh, where games outpaced everything else but but you know the the other industries using unity never went away and 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 we recently started sort of redeveloping that or deepening those relationships again um of course there's a whole bunch of stuff we hadn't learned that we needed to learn and now we're learning about how to engage with them and, and so on but yeah but but it was sort of always always involved in, in the in the idea or included um you know maybe much let's, later let's, yeah sorry let's let's rewind on that because i'm, I'm really mm -hmm. targeting customer onboarding really for mm -hmm. any new platform customer onboarding is such a challenging thing yeah. and if i look and if i look back at those early days not only in the studios and we can talk about games but we also can talk about any of the other customers how did you get those early developers onto the platform how did you get the first few to believe in the editor was it just organic was it through like the, the was, open source community how, how did how did they come to you and how did you manage them organic. I mean, so so <laughs> I, I, I mentioned that we started on a Mac, yeah, and there was like no game industry on the Mac, and game game companies didn't have Macs. So initially, the editor, the, the creation tool, was only available on on a Mac. Um, so basically, it was just a tiny, tiny community of game developers who had Apple computers, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know the set was so small. Like you know, when we put out the new even a point point release. 
you know, Macworld would write about it just because mm-hmm. there's nothing else to write about in this category. And then, you know, the few people that might actually be interested in this actually would then try and that, 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 download it. Um, so, you know, it was something about, you know, capturing, I think it's l- later I learned the concept of the blue puddle. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, and it's not a blue ocean because those don't really exist, but, but uh, like something small that like nobody cares about. Um, and where the, you know, the users in there care so much that they are willing to kind of you know, discover even, even kind of niche or new solutions. Um, yeah. And then, like I mentioned, like that, that just category ends up growing in multiple directions. Yeah. So if I move fast. away from the developer and I move mm-hmm. into the first intellectual property owners. So like, you know, there's a difference between somebody who's the building, who's using a view as a, as a tool versus somebody who's mm-hmm. investing their intellectual property, whether it be Marvel or like, I'm, I'm picking ones that I, I don't know if they were early customers, but if you think about some of the big studios, if you, there's, there's always that one first one that took a leap of faith. How did yeah, you get yeah. them to trust your brand? Like, how did that happen? One of the really early ones was uh, Cartoon Network. They were, they had, <laughs> you know, it's almost, I, I can tell you a story, but it's going to be like seven minutes and it's really convoluted. Yeah. And, 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 and at the end, we don't really learn much. So in this case, it was like, uh, the story was that Cartoon Network had hired a developer in Korea to build an MMO for them, for kids with their, with their IP. And it was kind of really cool, but also kind of a company that wasn't doing a good job putting it together. So they had a tech director in the US who was kind of leading the project from Cartoon Network's side. And he was actually using Unity to prototype his ideas and show it to the developer in Korea that had their own kind of proprietary engine, whatever. Um, and, and at some point he was so frustrated because he was able to make it feel right. Uh, like, you know, just like fighting mechanics, jumping mechanics, like the things that somehow the, the developer wasn't getting right, he was get, getting right. By the way, Rob, Rob Knopf, like, he, you know, he used to work for um, um, ah, one of the really old, uh, Ultima, Ultima, he did Ultima Online, right? So he's like, he's an early wow. MMO developer, like, like, like a guy who knows what he's doing, right? Yeah. He was just using Unity as a prototyping tool. He was sending little builds to the, the developer to kind of do it like this. And at some point, he just glimpsed it. Like, he's like, wait a minute. I've, I've, I've prototyped all the little actions. <laughs> if, 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 if we just put it together, it might feel great. Um, so, he, you know, so he actually contacted us about that. It was pretty brave of them, you know, they, but I think they're also, I don't know if they were desperate, but they were definitely worried about the situation as it was. Yeah. Um, so some kind of, yeah. <laughs> Like super, like like random, but also not. I don't know, not random. I mean, this is like this is a very serious person who, you know, uses Unity for real reasons, just the wrong reasons. Um, and then like you know, the ultimate uh, organic adoption, I guess. Um, yeah. It, it's not like we made a whole bunch of money from this game, but we learned a lot and and you know, just it was a cool cool showcase for a while. Well, there's always a first, right? But you know, if yep. you look at most businesses, there's always like the one or two or three clients that made them, you know, where you're like, okay, I just stepped up into the big leagues, which were the critical mm-hmm. partnerships that you needed to close that you were like, okay, we're not playing big, big <laughs> leagues. And how did you get them? Like, it was all these kind of, you know, sideways adoptions, right? So like electronic arts, you know, they were not going to use Unity for the longest time. They, they do now in, in multiple ways. But, but, you know, initially there was like a character builder for, for one of their sports properties because they wanted, oh, we had a browser plugin at the time. Now, now we run through WebGL, which is great. But, but back then we had a browser plugin and we were like maybe, maybe the only ones in the industry that had like a decent looking 3D browser plugin that, are, that actually worked. I mean, there was a few, but, but ours, ours actually worked mostly, <laughs> more often than not anyway. And, and so, so like somebody at EA started using Unity for that. And then we got sort of sideways adopted into a Tiger Woods game and, and some other stuff. Um, the funny thing is, by the, by the time there was an announcement and a big, you know, customer partnerships, I can't remember. There was some kind of press release years ago, yeah? By the time that actually happened and, and you know, we earned like the first million dollars or whatever of sales to them, you know, it was this... <laughs> It was so old news that you know there was nobody who had to kind of nobody wanted to pop champagne anymore because we had worked with them for years and you know we didn't get what we wanted out of the deal and you know it was just normal negotiation it was fair enough but you know <laughs> uh, I think I think it's pretty common that you know by the time you have this massive win it's already kind of ugh you know you're tired of it and you're working on the next thing um, but no 
like the relationship with EA was great and, and they're still a great, you know, a, a customer we're proud of, of course. Um, then, um, I mean, the, I think the, the big moment for us was actually apart from, well, there's a few big moments. I mean, launching Unity was just a big deal because it's really hard to launch a product with like, you know, three founders and a couple of helpers and a student worker or something. Yeah. Um, with documentation and website and, and the whole rigmarole. Um, then, um, 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 you know, just making it survive for the first couple of years, put, putting out the version 2.0 with like significant updates was extremely hard. Uh, and then, you know, the iPhone, the launch of the iPhone and the launch of the App Store in 2008 was a big deal because we rushed to that one. Mm. Um, I'm very proud of that, by the way. We, like, again, we didn't know how big it would be at all, but, but we had good intuition and we had a Mac background, so we sort of trusted Steve Jobs when he said that this would be a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he was right, so we were right. Um, <laughs> it's all good. But, so we broke good, for, for instance, like it, it's a pretty cool example. So, so we broke with good software engineering practices because the right way would have been to kind of have the iPhone version built into the normal version. So like, you know, you can just target from the same tool and that's how it works now. But, but we just realized, you know, we didn't have time for that or we didn't dare to have time for it. We didn't dare to give ourselves time for that. So we hired uh, Rinalda Vioma and, and Mantas Puida from, uh, from Vilnius and they uh, just kind of, we gave, just gave them the source code and they just m went and made a version of Unity that did that. Uh, it was separate and remained separate for two years. <laughs> so like, like a slightly different Unity, <laughs> which, nice. which is really bad, but yeah. you know, it was fast and it worked um, and, and allowed us to kind of have a very, very tight, uh, you know, bug feature iteration. Right? Um, so yeah, so it's it good decisions like that. It, so it sounds like some of this, these decisions, I mean, the way that you, you share the story, it, mm -hmm. it sounds a little bit like some of these were evolutions or there were not, oh, yeah. like, not accidents things. specifically, but like there were just kind of things that came, how much of, how much in the back end was there somebody managing these customers? Like how much of the organization was towards customer success versus Everything. just like, I, I, like for years, there was nobody who was not just like talking to customers uh, and we're still a porous organization. I mean, it's not everyone because it's not feasible, but, um, but no, it was just kind of everyone like, you know, I mean, I mean, I still at conferences, I still meet people who remember chatting with me, you know, in the middle of the night in whatever time zone. <laughs> Uh, probably in the middle of the night, my time was also, um, you know, sort of back in, you know, during these few, few years, like five, 2005, five, six, seven, eight, even later, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like it was just anyone and everyone, <laughs> including me, you know, as sort of CEO and, and whoever yeah. else. So being available, yeah. a huge thing. Yeah, just super available and, you know, it's not perfect. And again, like, you know, there is some noise and there's some confusion. You end up running after kind of noisy use cases rather than necessarily the, the visionary ones. Um, yeah. But I think we mixed that with, with also kind of our own, our own th theories and, uh, you know, uh, Joachim Ante, our, our my co-founder CTO is still there and amazing. Like, he's not the guy who gets pushed around easily. So like, you know, I think it was a good, good, good integration of, of kind of what we heard and, and what we thought was right. But, uh, but no, we heard, we heard a lot. I mean, we basically heard everything at the time. So if you look back now, you know, over the years that Unity has been, been going, and you had to highlight the top three pieces of advice that you'd give to somebody on the product management side of things. You know, you, you talked a little bit about constant contact with the customer. You talked about iterations. You talked about breaking some of the rules like, and, and forking the product so that you can deal with different platforms in a more quick way. What, what would you summarize to be the, the three top lessons that you'd give to somebody starting a new company like Unity where there's a heavy product investment? Yeah. It's, it's, so it's always going to be different, right? I mean, we had the luck, I guess, that it's not just luck, but you know, the path dependence that, that we knew, I mean, we, we just had a very, very strong intuition for our users. Like, you know, we, we had tried to make games like that. Uh, we did make a game like that, like, like with a small team at the time. Um, yeah, we just, you know, and, and, and we're lucky in that, like even now, you know, people who create Unity are, very similar to people who, and you know the variations and so on but so like there's just a lot of kind of intuition that is given for free right um so yeah you mix that with um um yeah just this attentiveness listening in being in touch with them 
it you know it, it makes it easier i mean you know I, I respect people who go and build products for like people that are very different from themselves because that's harder mm. <laughs> and requires like more, a more disciplined process i mean like we didn't have product management for years and years we do now and that's necessary because you know without product management you can easily miss things <laughs> okay let's go back so intuition is an amazing tool intuition is the most freaking fantastic thing you know about humans um and it lets us navigate really complex kind of decision spaces very fast and with sort of an mm -hmm. elegance you know because you know when you when you're making anything you're not making like one or two decisions you're making like 20 decisions per day right um and and you know those compounds you know over over a few years you will have made you know thousands and thousands of decisions um and if you're not um, and that's great. And if you don't have intuition, you're just going to be too slow. And like you'll be in an like you'll be you'll do you'll be doing analysis paralysis, you know, which is awful. Um, yeah. yeah. What what product management then can do is like capture the stuff that is not intuitive. Intuition has this un intuition is this wonderful tool, but it has this fates of flaw, which is that it's you know it, it just misses what it misses, you know, because you're not methodical, you're not capturing everything. So stuff that is not like in your heart will get skipped or, or, or missed mm. easily. Um, and so, you know, we missed some really critical things for years. Like, you know, at some point we, we, we knew that half the people using Unity or more were using Unity for 2D games, but Unity was really bad for 2D. Mm. <laughs> um, and, and multiple times we're like, yeah, we should really focus on this 2D use case. And, you know, and then, ah, you know, but 2D is not so exciting. It's like easy quote unquote, <laughs> 3D is hard. Um, so, you know, we, we missed that use case or we knew, but you know, nobody was intuitively following it. And even yeah. as a CEO, I would kind of task people with it. Like, ah, hey, you know, can you do that or fix that? <laughs> and then like nothing, not out of many malice, not even out of stupidity, just because, you know, we had this intuitive process and everyone was kind of working on what they felt was right. And mostly that was amazing. Um, so it, was, it wasn't until we found like somebody who just really care about 2D, we hired him. And then like people could sort of coagulate around him and then, you know, a 2D mode emerged that was great and it's, you know, really important in Unity um, yeah. and a big, big part of the product. But, but it didn't happen until we found somebody that had the intuition for it because, yeah, we had no methodical process to force it otherwise. Yeah. So, so it sounds like product management is what fills in the gaps post-intuition. Like you, you need the intuition, but product management manages that. Now, one of the things that you also commented on that was really cool, um, you, you, you name checked some of the people that you hired uh, to help drive this innovation. And one of the key things that companies ha have is, is how do you organize yourself, especially when you hire amazing talent, how do you build an organization to prevent, like I'm gonna use the term, like how do you prevent the diva from forming or how do you prevent factions from forming within the organization where one group has a re one religion, another group has another religion. How did you yeah. build, how did you build the organization or did you make mistakes and then try to retroactively fit it and have to fire people? Sure. How, how did you think about organizing something to take the best talent and not have it fork? You know, that's a really good question. Uh, the answer is we just largely didn't and largely just trusted people. Um, um, uh, there is a, you know, I think, I think all organizations are built like in the image of their founders and we were just three super low key kind of guys, very mm -hmm. different. Like I'm very social, my co-founders maybe less so. So like, it's not like we were all just the same, but we were all these kind of very low key people that had no wish to kind of boss anyone around or lead or, or, you know, manage for sure. Um, so I think it was just a lot of kind of letting people do their own thing. Uh, and having a lot of trust in people. Um, actually the, maybe the only management book we wrote for the first many years was uh, was Maverick by Ricardo Semler, uh, mm. <laughs> which is, which, you know, it's it's a, like he's built this unbelievable company based on sort of radical the radical um, like worker democracy, like real freedom. Um, and you know, I don't think we went there. We sort of had the intuition that you need a little. You need something slightly more centralized for a startup. Yeah. Like his, his is an, like a large sort of engineering conglomerate. As far as I know, I've never studied it very well beyond that initial book, I think. Mm. But, but, um, but we had this feeling that like, you know, you can trust these people. Like, you know, these are grownups. Like let's, let's 
let's just let them do their thing, you know. Yeah. And, and treat and treat them like that, and, and yeah. Um, so yeah, like I I think and I hope that that became the culture, and just yeah, not letting not getting too much in the way of people letting them do kind of what they wanted. Um, um, yeah, I think. I mean, of course, later, like you need some structures and a bit of management and you know, HR yeah. and, and, and that all came about. And, and I think, you know, these are, we sort of underdeveloped some of these functions, probably to our detriment initially. Yeah. And now, now, now also that is very well run at Unity. It's a fairly, fairly yeah. well run company, I, 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 I believe. But yeah. So um, two, two final questions then before we, mm -hmm. we start wrapping up. The sure. first one is if you could look back all throughout the entire history of Unity and do one do over. You know, one moment when you're like, man, I wish I could do that over. And then we're going to talk about your angel investments. But sure, sure. what's that one do over? Oh, man, um, that's a really good question. Um, one answer is that I wouldn't dare to change a thing because it seems like such a sequence of luck that, you know, it's like no butterfly must flap its wings differently yeah. than it, it actually happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if there was something, it was actually just like we, 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 we were pretty nervous and sort of like not that confident in a lot of areas. And I think we should have just been more confident, honestly, just like second guessing ourselves a bit less. Um, it wasn't terrible, but I think we could have moved with more speed and grace had we trusted our intuitions more. We would have been wrong anyway and intuitions like would have made us blind to certain things. So sure, like other, other mistakes would have been made, but, um, but honestly, like we would probably have just moved faster. Um, mm -hmm which is generally a good thing. Yeah. Um, well, so so yeah. tell us tell us about how that's manifested itself in terms of the the types of founder relationships that you're looking for now. I know that you're still mm -hmm. you're still obviously involved with Unity, but now that you're also yeah. investing in the new wave new generation of founders, what are the attributes you look for? And yeah, and tell us a little bit about those. So, you know, maybe the thing that I love most about running Unity and I stepped back 5 years ago now, uh, but I'm still on the board. But what was okay after the few first years where it just were just this, this heroic effort of a small band. What I what I ended up really loving was like you know working with the teams, advising the teams, and then you know sometimes I guess giving teams money, which is you know what kind of a leadership in a company does, um, to kind of you know further some projects and then probably unfortunately kill some others. And so so when I stopped being CEO, you know I think I got my fix by angel investing <laughs> in startups. Um, I'd already done that a little bit while I was running Unity, but but uh, but since I've, I've become very active, um, and I just love these kind of little intuitive, brilliant bands. You know, people that, yeah. So it's, I mean, that's what I look for. Like it's people that are obviously freaking smart and have some weird insight on the world, um, and then just have this kind of insecure confidence or some. I don't know. Like it's it's this kind of seeking confidence where you you don't really know what you're doing, but like you you. you you, you trust your decisions while you're making them or something um, and move through with grace. Um, and, and uh, you know, this, this, this really radical honesty, intellectual honesty we had between us as founders in Unity, where we had these infinite conversations about stuff we had no idea about. And we would even like kind of change positions along the way, uh, like literally swap positions uh, yeah. while talking because, you know, which is, not something you're seeking by itself, but it shows that you're really listening and, and, and open to, to, to the ideas. Um, so yeah, when I recognize that in teams, you know, that's kind of when I fall in love the most. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's a, a great attribute to look for and, and hopefully mm. people can take wisdom from that. Well, with that, David, uh, thanks so much. I mean, I feel like I could, I, there's so much meat there that we could definitely go into. Um, <laughs> Let's do another one. That, I, yeah, no, for sure. We got it definitely on, on some of these other customer segments you have. It's, it's so fascinating mm -hmm. to see how a company can then just blossom into a larger group of, of customers. But thank yeah. you for your time. And um, any, any Nothing. parting words? Um, well, no, I mean, it's just, uh, no, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I was just, just, just as you mentioned this user yeah. group, like customer segments. I mean, the, the, the fundamental insight is that, you know, whether people are working in a game company or at the big automotive company, like the developers are actually quite similar. Like they are these creative souls, they are smart, you know, they're seeking, they're trying to build products or solve problems. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that we speak to them, you know, got good at speaking to one group actually makes us good at speaking to the other groups because it's really kind of one group. And we see that even like, we see kind of a circular system between these industries. 
you know, people switching industries, but, you know, bring their talents and skills along uh, general talents, but also, well, it's kind of cool when they bring actual specific unity talents, of course. Yeah. So, well, yeah. thank you for that. And, and with that, <laughs> sure. guys, uh, thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for the chat. It's been, it's been a pleasure.